Welcome to On Texas Football. I'm Bobby Burton, your host, joined by C.J. Vogel of On Texas Football. Uh, this is the weekly state of the program. Adam Lowy sponsors that uh, each and every week uh, of the Lowy Law Firm. Uh, C.J., thanks for stepping in for Rod today. He had a personal uh, thing to deal with, so we're going to talk a little bit. He'll be back tonight for the live stream. I, the, the thought that I, I wanted to talk about today with Rod, and I, I'm going to push it off to you right now so we can talk a little bit about it. Uh, really, there's two big things going on right now. Texas's portal entries, uh, Texas now up to eight. Uh, we've mentioned a lot about that, but the, the piece that I want to go into now is has Texas actually filled the needs they the way they needed to fill them? Did they get the receivers they needed or did they miss on one or two? Did they get the defensive tackle they needed or do they still need one? I think they do. Same at tight end. Did they get the right guy, et cetera? Uh, I talk about that, and then I want to circle back to Jabbar Muhammad. We believe that he's leaning to to Oregon at this point. And then furthermore, this is the first week back for the players on campus, right? To, they're, they're actually been on campus for a week, but they're actually working out. I want to get any insight you've heard behind the scenes there and, and talk about some things that actually uh, I've heard as well. So let's start with the portal, okay? If you had to give Texas an overall grade for the portal, I would give them an A. What would you give them? That's exactly where I was leaning. I think what you've seen Texas do in terms of re, uh, repowering, getting some weapons back in that offensive uh, playmaking uh, scheme, that's exactly what they've done. You've added Isaiah, Bo uh, Isaiah Bond, uh, Matthew Golden, Silas Bolden in that group as well. You're looking at a group of wide receivers now that can compete and, and, and certainly are positioned to thrive against just about any defense in the country as a result of what they've already put on the field. And with the third year, Quinn Ewers, it certainly is encouraging for what he could potentially put up uh, next year in the SEC. That was a big question mark of will Texas have the guys that can take the top off of a defense and be able to make those explosive plays even more explosive. They added those guys right now. What, what do you say to a guy – I mean, this is a the fair question. Well, they got the guy to, they got three guys that look a lot like Xavier Worthy, but nobody that looks like A.D. Mitchell or Jordan Whittington. That that seems to me to be a fair, I don't not criticism critique, because they did they went all speed I think in, in the portal at wide receiver. You agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that was the approach, you know, and it kind of fell into their lap with the way that, you know, the coaching turnovers, you know, kind of shook up earlier this offseason, obviously. Uh, I don't think anybody was expecting Isaiah Bond to enter the, inner, the the transfer portal, but when he does, that's a type of talent, an instant game changer you don't pass up on. Uh, obviously, Matthew Golden was the first guy that Texas set their sights on. They wanted to go get the guys who had a similar build to what Texas had seen with a, an Xavier Worthy and obviously Jonte Cook on the field as well. The, the the guys that can make big plays happen after the catch. The big plays that happen because of the catch are nice, but afterwards when you can make guys miss and turn a 20-yard gain into 60 or 70 are ones that really open up the offense, and that's exactly what Texas added with Bond, Golden, and Bolden. That's yeah. a, the three pieces right there, and I know that we talked about C.J. Daniels as well as he was that big body fit that we talked about. He can go make the big plays down the field, I think when Texas saw Isaiah Bond enter the portal, all sights were set on him. And certainly, I mean, the number one wide receiver in the portal this offseason for a reason. Very talented and a, a pure fit, I think, in this offense. So so here's my take on that. I agree with you, first of all. I think that, that Sark's likely changing the offense a little bit. I mean, I'm not, he's, not, he's not a wholesale changer for no reason, right? That's not what he does. Um, it's more about this idea – I think that he's going to try to get more speed on the field at times. And that takes me to the tight end position a little bit too, because even the tight end is not necessarily an inline tight end. I mean, he, he's not even as big as JT Sanders. And JT yeah. Sanders was not a great blocker. Now, good, great player, but not necessarily a great blocker, right? Texas does more of the same with Amari Nyblack. Is he the right fit for this? Or is he also telling you, they're really going to try to spread it out a little bit this year. Because it, it feels to me that that's what Sark is, I don't know, I don't want to say he's saying to us, but he's kind of indicating it, that he's going to look to be a little bit more wide open, four wides, three wides, and a wide set tight end kind of thing than what we've seen. 
I think this is the preference of Steve Sarkeesian. And I, I want to go back to his first year at Texas, going out and adding, obviously, Jalil Billingsley to the tight end position. It's a similar skill set. You know, it's kind of a, a tall, lengthy, wiry tight end, but has good speed and separation ability for mismatches at the linebacker and safety position. Obviously, they don't provide that uh, kind of physically imposing will on the in the trenches and the run blocking and pass block, blocking sets. But these are the guys that you can really stretch and, and, and stress defenses vertically. I think with Nye Black, you're going to see that a little bit more. Hopefully, obviously, that he stays on the field a little bit longer and has a little bit more of an impact than Billingsley did at Texas. But uh, when you add him to an offensive game plan that already has, you know, the, the four guys that we just mentioned, plus Ryan Wingo, who are you going to key in on to stop? There's so many different weapons across that entire offense that speed can beat you just about everywhere. And I think that's ultimately where Steve Sarkeesian was hoping to take his Texas offense and where we'll eventually see it uh, to begin the 2024 season. So you think last year and year before was just more of a out of a necessity of what what they had on hand. And he tried to. OK, I, I can see that because he definitely went a lot of four wides at Alabama when he had four first round picks. I mean, yeah, and I think one other point is the first guy that he went out to get was Xavier Worthy. He prioritized speed from the get-go. He had Jatavian Sanders on, on campus. He had Jordan Whittington on campus, two guys that bled burnt orange and still were very productive players. Not necessarily, I think, of the skill set that he envisioned getting at Texas that really was just speed over speed over speed. Interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that with Worthy in that respect, but he did go to the portal last year for Adonai Mitchell, which is a Absolutely. little bit – it's a backwards rotation there a little bit to, to, from what we're talking about. I want to get to the defensive side of the ball next. But first, I want to say thank you to our sponsor. Each and every state of the program brought to you by our friend Adam Lowy at the Lowy Law Firm. He's been helping injured Texans for decades. I give him a call if you've been hit, hurt in a car wreck, a motorcycle accident, truck, anything that uh, you think you might be dealt or need the compensation for or do compensation for, 512-280-280. 0800 or visit him at lowylawfirm.com. One thing about Adam, he does not take no signing up immediately or anything like that. He wants to talk to you first to see if you're actually due compensation. He thinks he can help you out. Uh, visit him again, lowylawfirm.com. All right, uh, CJ, the defensive side of the ball, Tia Oa Aya um, Savea, a young man out of Arizona, is the only defensive line commit at this point. He has been a rotational guy for Arizona for two years. Then they added Kendrick Blackshear, the linebacker out of Alabama, who he was only a rotational player for Alabama. Very good in, in uh, the uh, special teams aspect of the game, by the way. That's that's one that comes from a friend of mine that works at Alabama. And then also Andrew McCuba, uh, the safety nickel out of Clemson. So here's my take. Savea uh, and Blackshear are good pieces to the puzzle. Um, but I think that if you were really looking for a starting linebacker, you probably needed something more. I think Blackshear is a, you know, a, a, a reinsurance policy, so to speak. Uh, Save, I, I think, is going to play a little bit more than that. I mean, he's he's a little bit higher in the, the category of, hey, we need this guy to contribute. But out of all of them, Makuba is the one that gives them the versatility in the secondary that they desperately needed. Uh, that and the return of Jade Barron sets up the defensive backfield so, so well. Tell me what you think of those three guys, and are you seeing it kind of in the same uh, way, or are there tweaks to that you want to you want to mention? Yeah, I kind of view this defensive approach as building a cake. You know, you have Jade Barron and – or uh, sorry, Andrew Makuba and Trey Moore as kind of your – your cake batter and your milk and your flour that go into building the cake. Those are the big uh, yeah. Things. I forgot to mention. I forgot to mention Trey Moore in that, and that's definitely the pass rush element that I forgot to mention. Yeah. Well, the two of them I see are very you know integral pieces to, that go into building this defensive cake. You know, metaphorically. And okay. then you go out and you add Kendrick Blackshear, who probably is the sprinkles a little bit later on. You know. You, you don't necessarily think he's going to be on the field for every down. He's kind of been a, a piece that you've seen rotationally in, to, in the mix for Alabama over the last couple of years. Uh, and Savi is an interesting one to me because I think he's a bit of an icing piece. You know, he's what helps make the defense look pretty. You know, you, you see him in that middle of the defensive line. He's been a rotational piece at Arizona, as you mentioned. But he's a guy that can stop the run very, very well. 
Yeah, that was his strength at Arizona. He has strong hands. He doesn't get pushed back off the ball too long. Uh, stays very gap sound, and that's very important for Texas going into the SEC with the big interior offensive lineman that they're set to face. So he's a sprink, or he's an icing piece to me. And then obviously Kendrick Blackshear at the linebacker spot. I didn't necessarily think Texas needed a linebacker piece, but they went out and got one as a result uh, to add to the experience of that room, which was going to you know rely on first-year starters at both the Mike and Will for a full duration of a season. They didn't have that with Jalen Ford leaving for the NFL. So you look at Blackshear kind of as a, you know, let's let's fancy up this cake a little bit. Let's help the presentation as a whole. So you got your main pieces, main ingredients with uh, Moore and Makuba, kind of the guys that you are going to rely on being on the, on the defense for any sort of meaningful snap for the duration of a game. And then Sevilla and Blackshear certainly help make defenses – uh, look look prettier in my eyes as a result of stepping in and having experience in production at previous stops, whereas Texas would have been relying on someone who didn't have that. All right, th that, that's going to do it for the portal discussion. I, I, I will add this. We do not believe at this point in time that the Jabbar Muhammad is going to end up a Longhorn. Uh, it looks like he's favoring either Oregon or uh, Alabama at this point. I also believe that Texas, you know, they felt uh, good about Muhammad a week ago. Uh, they also felt like he was a little bit of, lu uh, of a luxury, given the fact that Terrence Brooks and M Manny Muhammad return as starters at that position, plus Andrew Makuba and Jade Barron coming back. Uh, if a uh, another corner goes in and Texas wants to take a look, it's going to have to be a guy that they think is a true shutdown corner, is what I'm being told. And I'm not sure Jabbar Muhammad, uh, who is good, necessarily fits that M.O., uh, we'll see if uh, Texas goes after someone like Takuro Davis uh, out, out of uh, Arizona. But again, we think he may be ending up at Washington or Oklahoma uh, at this point in time. All right, uh, let's let's take a, a little step forward and, and talk a little about the guys that are on campus and the first couple of workouts. They started were true workouts. They met on Monday, started true workouts on Tuesday. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, CJ, as the Longhorns go through all of this? Well, it's exciting. You know, you add so many new pieces, 18 uh, freshman enrollees. You add the handful of pieces from the portal as well to this group. You start to see and get a, an early sense of what they'll be able to bring to the table. Obviously, spring football will give you a clearer picture of that. But getting to see them, you know, in the shorts and shirts, running, showing agility, the mobility, that's certainly encouraging to me. And it's something that the Texas staff is uh, really looking forward to getting them acclimated to the system, the culture, and everything that Texas football has become over the last couple of years. This is where the things begin. And you'll see the clips shown out by the uh, the Texas media department, which does a, a tremendous job uh, over the next couple of years, uh, over the next couple of weeks, getting this group 100% up to speed and into the culture about why this is so important for the 2024 season. Have you heard of any young guys already looking good, guys that you think are standing out at this point? Yeah, one is actually a, a sophomore now. So uh, Warren Roberson was a guy that I think Texas fans, uh, co Texas coaching staff specifically, had a, a very high hope for uh, heading into his freshman season. We didn't see a lot of them. Uh, I think he's one that has plus athleticism, especially at that cornerback's position, is going to push the guys out there in that position as well. Really encouraging. There's going to be a, a, a lot of, of talk about Brandon Baker as well, the true freshman enrollee on the offensive line. Uh, he was one that is just getting to campus as a result of playing in the Polynesian Bowl as well. Uh, the other one is Parker Livingstone. I've, I've been very high on him. His straight line speed is very impressive. I don't think a lot of people are realizing that. He's about 6'4", so the bigger body doesn't necessarily scream speed demon, but he was a track kid. He was a two-sport uh, kid as well uh, back at Lovejoy before he graduated. But that is uh, the, the speed is one that I've been told for him is one that really is standing out early on. Interesting. Uh, I heard, I've heard some good things. I'll, I'll pass on what I've heard. Zena Omiozulu uh, showed up to campus looking outstanding. I've heard Alex January is in great shape for his size and his age. So keep that one on your hat. And then Ryan Wingo, young man out of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, has already done some things that they're, they're really impressed with. Uh, I, I also would say this. Um, uh, this is a big offseason for a couple of guys in particular. Uh, I, I want to say that Ethan Burke is one of those. Uh, who needs to take that next step, as does Manny Muhammad. Uh, the Longhorns going to be counting on Manny Muhammad this year more than ever, and he's going to move in, be moving into a full-time role. Uh, alongside, you mentioned Warren Roberson pushing those guys. Uh, there's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle right now 
uh, as it relates to the Longhorns that we have to uh, be monitoring, uh, et cetera. Okay, last piece I want to mention and talk about here. Uh, Texas had a big junior day, but now I want to put it up against the junior day that A&M is trying to have this coming weekend, as well as the one they had on January 13th. Uh, Texas went with one big weekend. a and is trying to position itself in a couple of different ways with people. Uh, where do you think Texas is at and, and you know, uh, whether or not A&M is actually making making some headway on some guys or, you know, is this to A&M Junior Day kind of a play down situation in Texas is just so far out ahead on some of these guys that it's just basically Texas needs to hold serve this weekend. Well, it's certainly interesting that AM's kind of split their junior day. You know, you talked about the one on the 13th that had a pretty, pretty nice list of visitors. It obviously wasn't big, but they had some impact guys from around the state of Texas that ranked pretty highly. They're going to be doing the same again this weekend. Uh, what's interesting here is Texas obviously coming off their big junior day and their obvious uh, uh, season run as well kind of lends them to having a little bit of an upper edge uh, at momentum, whatever you want to call it. That's as a result of Steve Sarkeesian sticking around and not having a restart here. Uh, that's going to help the Texas Longhorns in the 2025 cycle, specifically on the in-state crop. You talk about having longer relationships, developed a, a, a evaluations as well for these kids. Texas is looking like the it's school, as we've mentioned uh, last weekend on the Sunday or the Saturday breakdown. That's exactly how Texas and recruits are viewing Texas right now. When you start winning, that helps recruiting so much more. And Texas necessarily hasn't had that on the recruiting trail over the last 10 years. So that's going to be helpful. a and is also playing from behind a little bit. You have brand new coaching staff coming in. Uh, there's not a lot of familiarity with this group. I was actually talking to uh, uh, Landon Rink uh, back at the Texas Junior Day. I said, hey, you know, who are some of the schools that have come by to, to see you? And the first one that you mentioned was Texas A&M. I asked him, I was like, what's your relationship like with Mike Elko? Have you talked to him prior to his job at, at A&M becoming the head guy? He said no. Whenever he was at A&M previously, he wasn't being recruited by A&M because he was just so young. And I think that's going to be the biggest factor for a lot of these guys, uh, in, especially on the defensive side of the ball. They just weren't at the age to be recruited yet when Elko came or was originally at Texas A&M. So it's going to be a complete restart of uh, relationships there now that he is the head coach. Uh, yeah, and, and a couple guys that are coming in that I think are, are important to watch this weekend uh, because Texas wants them both. Uh, Cypress Bridgeland offensive lineman Ryan Foji and Jonte Newman. Those two guys have both been offered by Texas. They're both going to AM this weekend. Uh, Bridgeland is where Connor Wegman went to school. Uh, so there's some history there with that school. Uh, but I mean, that looks like it could be a very interesting recruitment and maybe a, I don't want to say a, uh, a bellwether recruitment uh, for those two, but it's certainly a, a duo that anybody in the state wants and out of state essentially right now. You, yeah. you think those are bellwether recruitments maybe to see where Texas really is and where A&M really is in, in this situation right now? Yeah, certainly. And with the two of them specifically, I think that, as you mentioned, there's a number of schools that are hoping to get their hands on them. You know, they're very talented. They're probably in the, in, in the conversation for the most talented tackle duo in the state. Uh, interesting with them, they take visits together. They're going to AM together. They were at Texas together. They were at Houston the week before together. Oklahoma also is very high on both of their lists. So as Ryan Foji's recruitment is really starting to heat up, it'll be interesting to see whether or not the term package deal ever arises because they've seemingly be going uh, step by step together with one another since their recruitments have really taken off this offseason. It's very interesting because I, I think both of them really terrific players and we know Texas has has identified them and kind of pointed them out, uh, well, as well as some other offensive linemen. That's far from the only ones. Uh, Michael Fasusi, by the way, was ex the big offensive lineman out of Louisville, was expected to visit Oregon this weekend. He's not doing that uh, any longer. All right, that's going to do it for the state of the program. Thanks again to uh, our friend Ad Adam Lowy. If you've been injured in, uh, on the job, in a car wreck, in a truck wreck, et cetera, give Adam and his group a call, 512-280-0800 or visit them at LoweyLawFirm.com. Uh, CJ, one final question. Anything you're looking forward to this weekend that we need to be aware of or think, be thinking about? There's a seven-on-seven -seven tournament up in Dallas, a lot of big prospects up there, as well as just the continuation of Texas getting acclimated uh, to uh, their winter workouts. That'll be something that will be 
at the top of my list of getting intel and updates for because it's obviously a, a new era of, of, of Longhorns on the 40 acres. 20-plus new guys took to the field for the first time, to your point, on Tuesday. All right, uh, C.J. Vogel, thank you very much. Uh, thanks again to Adam Lowy. For C.J. Vogel, I'm Bobby Burton. This has been State of the Program. Welcome.